Good afternoon. It's great to be here. Today I want to share a story with you about an experience that we recently went through at Adobe. Now, how many of you use Adobe products? Great, thank you. By the way, I just came to interrupt your afternoon to remind you to update your Adobe software. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. Um, I know you keep it all up to date. So a few years ago, we were faced with a challenge at Adobe. We needed to take our 25-year history of putting award-winning software on round, shiny things and putting it inside cardboard boxes and shipping it around the world. And we needed to completely invert that business to now taking those same software experiences and turning them into services available on any device, any platform, from desktop to mobile, anywhere in the world. This was a huge challenge, a complete inversion of the way that we run business, not only technologically, but from a business model perspective. And this transition has actually gone very well. And today, people are using our creative tools like Photoshop and Acrobat, Illustrator, InDesign, and many others across devices and platforms. Wherever you are, you can now use them as an online service. And we can update them not once every two years or 18 months. We can update them constantly, bringing you new features and new capabilities. But the shift that this required internally in our systems was vast. And as we looked forward a few years ago into this future, we decided that we needed to have a new way to innovate, a new way to bring capability into our tools faster and better than we had ever done before. We went out and we looked at all of the processes that were out there, from doing internal incubators to doing seed startups internally to doing boot camps for new ideas. We looked at all the processes, and in fact, we had done many of those processes ourselves, and we still continue to do so, but we needed something different. We wanted to elicit the new kind of innovation, what we call emergent innovation, the kind of innovation that our organization doesn't know how to ask for. Now, most organizations have seen this happen. We've seen it happen at Adobe, innovation that emerges grassroots from the rank and file, and in fact becomes successful often with the organization ignoring it, or sometimes even trying to stop it from happening. It says, wait, we didn't ask for that new thing. That isn't what we thought we were building. But there's a person or a small group of people inside the organization so passionate, so excited, so connected to a customer or that customer's problem that they are determined to launch this new effort. We've seen this happen inside our organization, but it's very hard to plan for that to happen. It's very hard to tell people, well, think of the things that we don't know how to ask for and do that too. So at Adobe, we have typical top-down innovation in our product groups, like the Photoshop group and other teams. They're making new features and new versions all the time. In fact, we just released some a week ago. We also have research labs. Uh, we do university collaborations. We do deep research where we come up with voodoo magic like content-aware fill that can replace parts of an image that were never there, synthesizing image out of something that didn't exist before. It's almost magical seeming. And that's part of our long-term research. But we wanted something else, this sort of bottom-up grassroots innovation. And we couldn't find a way to do it anywhere else. So we had to come up with a new process. And we did. We call it Kickbox. And I'm here today to share with you Kickbox, how it works, and why it works. Because it's being phenomenally successful for us inside of our organization, and in fact, it's been so successful, it's been written about in Fast Company, and in Inc., and in Forbes, and Fortune, and Harvard Business Review, and many other publications are incredibly excited about this new approach. But I'm going to warn you up front, it's radical. It's not your typical approach to innovation. It's very different, and it's challenging for an organization to implement. We've been doing this now for almost two and a half years inside our company. And as I mentioned, it's been very successful for us, so much so that word is spread outside of Adobe. And we had other companies contacting us and asking us to explain, what the hell is this kickbox thing? It sounds crazy. Like, does this work? Why are you guys doing it? And, and could we do it too? So a few months ago, we responded to that, those internal requ external requests coming into us, and we decided to open source kickbox. So everything I'm about to show you that we're doing is something that you can go to kickbox.adobe.com and download. The complete instructions to make your own version of the red box to adapt it. In fact, there are some organizations in France, are, in France already localizing it uh, into French, which is awesome. 
and that's being localized into several languages as an open source effort online. So if anything that I'm about to tell you about intrigues you, you can go and use it absolutely for free and adapt it inside your organization. And we do believe it needs to be adapted to go into every organization. Your kickbox won't be exactly like Adobe's kickbox. But the same principles, the same things that are driving success from this can apply into your organization as well. So what's the goal of Kickbox? Well, one of the first goals that we wanted to achieve with this is we wanted to increase our innovation failure rate. Now, what does that mean? In a typical year at Adobe, we might have taken a dozen ideas to maybe two dozen ideas and taken them to the point where we would actually prototype them and put them in front of our end users to get a reaction, not as a launching product, but as a prototype or a mock-up. And those dozen to two dozen ideas, we might spend $100,000 to a quarter of a million dollars, maybe even up to a half a million dollars on each one to do that exploration, mock it up, prototype it, put it in front of customers, have a team of product managers bring customers in and have them play with that mock-up or prototype to try to decide if it was something we wanted to pursue. And out of that dozen to two dozen tests that we might do, we might actually get one or two new initiatives or features or products that we wanted to launch. That was actually too high of a success rate. Kickbox is a complete inversion of that model. So with Kickbox, in the last two years, we have funded 1,100 experiments, and we have done it for less than doing three in the old way. So much lower cost each, much higher speed, way higher quantity, astronomically higher failure rate. But the absolute cost of trying 1,100 things was lower than the absolute cost of doing a dozen before, because we're using new techniques to do this. Curious? Let me explain more. First of all, where do we deploy Kickbox? Any employee can get a box, by the way. Any employee inside the organization. When I say any, it doesn't just go to product roles, doesn't just go to engineers, doesn't just go to product managers, doesn't just go even to frontline kind of workers you might assume. Admins, HR, janitorial, anybody in our 12,000 person organization can get a red box. If they have an idea, they just ask for a red box. They can come to a two day training where we show them how to use the tools inside the red box. Now they don't have to, but their success is higher if they uh, come and learn how to use the tools that are inside the box. But they can get their hands on a red box. So the first question that arises is, well, wow, you're gonna let anybody do it, that's cool, but how do you select the ideas? So here's a crazy thing. We don't select the ideas. We fund every single one of them with a red box. So employee comes to us and says, I have an idea. We go, great, stop, don't tell us. Don't tell your manager, don't tell anybody you work with. Here's a red box. Go and experiment with your idea. We believe in you. Go try it. Now, how can we do that? Because the absolute cost of them experimenting with that idea is pretty low. Let me explain what's inside the box. So when they come to the workshop, they get this box. Inside is funding for them to explore their idea. So there's no committee, there's no set of managers, there's a prepaid credit card in the box with their funding to fund their experimentation with the idea we have not heard yet because we don't want to hear the idea until they've engaged with customers. Why? Because I could be wrong. Another manager or leader inside our company could be wrong. We could hear the idea and think that's a dumb idea, and it turns out to be an excellent idea. We don't want the cost of that false negative to spiral out of control. So if we can cap the cost of actually experimenting, we can do all of the ideas. That's the crazy question. Why don't we just fund every idea every employee has? for them to go and explore. That doesn't mean fund it to shipping. It doesn't mean green light to make a million of them and put it out to customers. That means go and test it with some customers, a small number of customers, and get real world feedback. So they start with $1,000 on the cart. And there are no expenses required, no receipts, no reporting, nothing to fill out, no justification that they need to do in advance or after. They get the credit card because we want zero friction to their process. We want them to go and innovate, and that's incredibly important to us. But think about that. A thousand, thousand dollar credit cards is a million dollars. That would be two ideas to prototype, maybe under the old system. Now we can do a thousand of them to prototype using new techniques. So what else is in the box? Well, there's actually some candy bars. 
Uh, there is a Starbucks gift card because sugar and caffeine are two of the four major food groups of all innovators. And we want them to know we are serious about you innovating. Now, is it easy to just give $1,000 out to employees? No. Our finance group... <laughs> you want a what? With no receipts? No reporting? No... <sighs> it's probably illegal. You can't do it. <laughs> but first, we had to step back and explain, if we stop innovating as an organization, innovation is our lifeblood. And if we can't innovate the future, we're dead. We are dead. It may take a long time for an organization the size of Adobe, when we're dead, for the corpse to actually hit the ground. Could take you a long time. But, I told our finance group, it's guaranteed if we're dead, the first people they lay off is finance. No, I'm kidding. Actually, but they understood, this is a chance for finance to innovate as well. To come up with a way to say yes, to make it easy for people to get the funding, small amount, to go out and get in motion quickly and innovate. And you know what? It works. It works incredibly well because when the employees get the box and they get that credit card, they understand something profoundly important. The company trusts my judgment. And establishing that trust, not through telling them in words, but through something far more powerful, action, was something that obviously breaks rules in an ordinary organization, including ours, was a clear message as to how important this was and how much we're counting on them. So it sends a message in addition to giving resources. There's also instructions. There's a complete process, in fact. It's broken down into six levels. Each level has a set of actions that you complete at the end of the level, and when you've checked off all of the actions for level one, you can go to level two. When you've done the same in level two, you go on to level three, and so on, until you get to level six. Now, what happens if you complete all the steps in level six, you check off all the boxes in level six? See, it's self-gating. There's nobody else managing the process or judging what they're doing. They are their own judge, and they're going through and checking off the boxes. And when they get to the end of level six, they have beaten the red box. See, the red box is not your friend. The red box is an obstacle for you to overcome as an innovator. And when you have beaten the red box, you get a fabulous prize. It's a blue box. <laughs> What's in the blue box? No one knows. But I can tell you that it's delivered by leprechauns who come in riding on unicorns, and it fulfills all of your product dreams we can advance further on with their idea and actually bring it closer to shipping when they have beaten the red box. So the blue box is really turning it, their experiment and their data into a shipping product. So what are the levels? I'll quickly run you through them. Level one is called inception, and it is all about motivation. Now that may seem like an odd place to start, talking about innovation, but in my experience in my own startups, before Adobe bought my most recent startup, doing my own products, and in doing products at Adobe. My experience, look, getting paid is great. I'm not gonna argue with getting paid. I like getting paid. It's one reason I show up to work every day. But it is not the only reason I show up to work every day. In fact, it's not even the primary reason I show up to work every day, and I challenge you and we tell all of our employees if the generous paycheck and compensation and benefits package at Adobe is the number one reason that you come to work every day, we would like you to begin the search for a new job. Because, of course, it's important to get paid and get rewarded for your work, but you need to be driven by something else. Life is too short to be working solely for the paycheck. We don't need more drones. We don't need more hired by the hour employees. We need more people that are driven by their passion. Oh, and yes, the money is necessary and good, but they're there for a reason. Somebody asked me once, why do you work at Adobe, Mark? And I said, because I've spent most of my adult life doing creative tools, making creative tools and empowering end users, and I love it. It's an awesome, fun thing to do. So asking me why I work there is like asking somebody who's an astronaut, why do you work at NASA? Well, because I want to go into space, right? And so if you want to make creative tools, where should you work? Well, Adobe makes the world's leading creative tools at the moment, so you should probably come and work at Adobe because it can help you fulfill your passions. You can do the things you're excited about here. And if there's something else that you're more excited about, then you should go the place that you can do that. We want people at Adobe who are excited 
about what we're doing because we can align then our organizational purpose, our customers' hard problems, that organizational purpose we want to solve, we can align that with the passions of our people. And when we can do that effectively, there's no problem we can't solve. We can change the world together. Without that alignment, everything, everything gets harder. So when you look through your organization and you say, why is this so hard? The reason it's so hard, the reason things are going wrong has a root cause. And we believe it's because you have a lack of alignment between enough of your people being aligned with what your organizational purpose is for you to be successful. Because when you create that alignment, you can be hands off. You can trust people and they will do the most remarkable things with that trust. When you don't have that alignment, everything gets a lot harder. So level one is all about them figuring out why do they want to do this and actually writing it down. Level one is the one level they never share with anybody else because their motivations are personal to them. But when they find that alignment, and actually, I don't care what it is. Sometimes I've invented products just because something pissed me off, right? Something was broken about the world and I want to fix it because that's broken. That can be an outstanding motivation. As long as you have a motivation that's personal, real, and powerful to you, then you have the drive to do that hard thing that we call innovation. The next thing that we teach them in level two is how to have ideas. Having ideas, turns out, is not exactly trivial, and it's not something where the clouds part and Gandhi comes to you in a dream and reveals a marvelous idea. It's not the way it works. How do you have good ideas? By having a lot of bad ideas and getting really good at trying to pursue those ideas through trying and failing. So we don't expect most people to succeed necessarily even on their first red box, which is another reason why the cost is low. So in level two, there's also a little notebook called Bad Ideas. That's inside the box. The Bad Ideas book is where they write down all the bad ideas. Now people always look through the box when they get it and they say, but where's the good ideas notebook? There is no good ideas notebook inside the box. The reason why is because all new ideas tend to look like bad ideas, except for a very few, which you are absolutely certain is the awesomest idea ever. And those are definitely bad ideas. So you should just write them all down in the bad ideas book. Don't judge them first, just capture them. Once you capture them, then you can start sorting and organizing them. And that's what we do in level three, where we polish winners and we teach them how to pick the right one. And there's a bunch of tools, scorecards, and a business model canvas, and checklists that they can use. And these are people filling them out, learning how to use these tools. And in level four, they actually go out and talk directly to customers. That's right, they try out an idea that they've had, that they've been evolving without any management approval. Marketing doesn't know, branding doesn't know, product management doesn't know, nobody in the company knows what their idea is. And we give them tools to go out and test directly with customers. Why? Because the customer's opinion is the one that matters. Next, after they've talked with customers and gotten some feedback so they understand that there is a real problem, the second part of level four is they go out and test that the solution is actually a fit, which means they test directly with customers, a behavioral test directly with customers. So I'm gonna show you a quick example that actually a team of ours in Europe did. Uh, this was a site, that, uh, a test that they did called photoedit.me. The premise was that there's a lot of people out there that know how to use tools like Photoshop, and there's a lot of people out there that have images that they wanna have modified, but some people don't know how to use Photoshop that wanna use, that wanna have pictures repaired. So could we pair up people that know how to use Photoshop with people that maybe, I just need this couple of images fixed. I don't need to hire an artist for a week. I just need a quick fix. So they put up this test website with no code. They just used a website template builder, put up a website, it cost $20. It took about a half an hour. They used a standard template and some stock photos and they put this up and they drove traffic to it using Google AdWords. They actually bought ads and drove people to this site. And they asked people to upload. So there was no codes. They just used a standard upload form that was part of the template website builder. And people uploaded these actual images from real customers with these real requests. These are modifications they actually wanted. And over the first few days, they got 4,000 unique visitors and 9% of them uploaded photos. Wow. So there's real demand. So people actually have this problem. Not only that, they were searching for a solution. And when they saw a solution in a Google AdWord, they were willing to come to a website. And when they saw the proposition on the website, they were willing to upload a photo to get it fixed. That's a huge amount of learning. In fact, I have a cost of customer acquisition now. This team knows how much it costs, how much they have to advertise to get one customer to upload a photo. What did they do? They went and by hand modified all of the photos that people uploaded and send them back. 
Why? Because we always fulfill and exceed our customers' expectations. They send it back to them. They said, do you like it? Customers filled out a survey. We love this service. Perfect. They now have enough data to maybe go stalking, start talking to their manager about their idea. Right? We want them to actually do that test before talking to a manager. But they had another thing that they wanted to find out. They wanted to find out, first of all, would people pay? And second of all, what about the supply side? Would artists do this work? People that know how to use Photoshop, would they do the work? So they changed the site to say $1.99 is what it would cost, because this was for free. 9% would convert for free. It dropped to 2.7% conversion rate, of course, because now it costs money. They didn't really charge anybody any money. Once they clicked pay, it said, hey, today it's free, congratulations. So we didn't charge anybody for our test. And they still went and modified their photos by hand and sent it back to them. So everybody got free photos modified how they wanted. So that was their supply side, that was their demand side validation. Supply side, they just put up a new website, same template. And they said, hey, do you know how to use Photoshop? Would you like to learn a little, earn a little extra money? So they ran new ads, pointed people to this site, 600 unique visitors, 22% of them signed up, which means signed up for the service. And of the 22% that signed up, 25% actually completed a task, which means they modified some photos and sent them back. So we learned that people would do this, people would pay for it, that there was a complete cycle that we could get going, a two-sided marketplace, and then the team started preparing to go meet management to talk about their idea which was a profoundly different meeting. So let me just explain, level six, we want to stop playing this game that most organizations play. We call it HIPPO, highest paid person's opinion. You guys ever played this in your organizations? Right, somebody has an idea and everybody goes, hmm, sits back and waits for the highest paid person at the table to render their judgment as to whether it's good or not. Well, I'll let you in on a little secret. Sometimes the highest paid person's opinion is wrong. In fact, quite often, the highest paid person's opinion can be wrong. So you know how you win an argument with me? You know how you win an argument with our CEO? Bring data, don't bring an opinion. So I could say, you know, I don't think anybody would wanna do this. And the team could say, oh wow, that's an interesting opinion, Mark. We have some data from several thousand customers that says they want to. How are you gonna to respond to our data? So now I have to deal with their data. I can question their data. I could say, let's do a different experiment, but I have to deal with their data before I can dismiss their idea. And that is what we want to have happening in the first pitch to management at our company. So how's it working? Well, it's actually working pretty well. About 92% complete inception, 63% complete ideation. So you can see there's a huge fall off here because we don't need a huge number of winners for us to be successful. So to date, we've awarded 23 blue boxes and we already have several new shipping product features and products that have come out of Kickbox. So in terms of return on investment versus any other innovation effort that we've tried to do inside the organization, this exceeds wildly. The top-down innovation, the labs innovation, any other kind of boot camp, workshop, incubator that we've ever done. I'm not saying you shouldn't continue to do those, but this is the extra layer you can add on top to do something that none of those other processes will give you, to widen the diversity of inputs at the top of your funnel and ultimately to align passion with purpose, and that's how you can win, and that's how we're doing it at Adobe. And if you'd like to bring something like Kickbox to your organization, you can do so just by going to kickbox.adobe.com and trying it out for free. Let us know how it goes for you, thanks.